we will be recording as you just heard. Um, this is just mostly for to share with those who are unable to attend today. So, um, but just, just be aware of that. <clears throat> So as you can see, as I said, we're conducting this in meeting mode because um, we're hoping to have a more interactive session. But that does mean that you would should please try to keep yourself on mute until we get to the discussions uh, section of this. Um, and then you can feel free to, to go off mute and then please also introduce yourself before you ask a question. You'll also be able to pose questions in the chat function. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to do a round of introductions, although I'd love to have done so. But uh, yeah, well, I think if you want to, you can also uh, change your names uh, on your, your photos or your, your squares to include your organization as well. They'll have a better, better sense of, of who we all are. So today's investor briefing is focused on a recently released, I believe October 31st, um, amnesty report called A Death Sentence for My Father, uh, which highlights Meta's role in human rights abuses in Northern Ethiopia. Um, in the Northern Ethiopia conflict, Meta um, and their content shaping, um, Meta's content shaping algorithms fueled devastating human rights impacts as the report will show by amplifying inflammatory, harmful, and divisive content against the Tigrayan community on Facebook. Um, Ethiopia, which is Ethiopia's most popular uh, social media platform. Uh, this was facilitated in particular by Meta's surveillance-based business model focused on engagement at all costs. Um, and we're gonna hear from Alia and I'll introduce Alia in a second in more detail about this. This is actually Amnesty International's second report assessing Meta's role in human rights abuses in conflict affected and high risk areas often referred to as CARAs for short following a 2022 report focusing on the Rohingya in Myanmar, and we actually had an amnesty briefing then as well. If you go to the Investor Alliance webpage, events webpage, you'll, you can always uh, watch a recording of that briefing. Um, both reports raise concerns on the continued and systemic nature of Meta's failures uh, that took place in Myanmar and occurred again in Ethiopia. So today, if we wanna uh, go forward, um, annotate to the bio slide, um, we're joined by Alia al Ghussein, researcher and advisor on, uh, on artificial intelligence and human rights at Amnesty International. Her work focuses on the big tech business model and in particular the human rights impacts that big tech has in conflict affected settings. Then we'll hear from uh, Jamie Coconia and Laura O'Connor from Access Now. <clears throat> Jamie will be sharing insights on what is happening on the ground in Ethiopia, as well as the status of ongoing lawsuits filed against Meta related to the violence in Ethiopia. And Laura will shed light on the systemic nature of Meta's failure to address harmful impacts in situations of conflict. She'll highlight the expectations of Meta under the EU Digital Services Act, and will share her analysis of Meta's claims in its 2023 Human Rights Report that it manages such settings effectively. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Alia, um, and please feel free to share your slides. Thank you, and thanks for Thank you. Um, can you just let me know if you can hear me okay? I'm not sure that my internet yes. connection. No, we yeah. can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, if, actually, can't, Aditi, we can't see your slides yet. Aditi, could you go to the next slide, please? We decided that because they're already up, it makes sense to do it oh, this good. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Great. Okay, great. So um, I'll get started. Firstly, thank you everyone for coming. Um, it's really great to be able to do this briefing and for there to be um, interest in this report. Um, as Rebecca already said, my name is Alia and I'm a researcher um, on big tech accountability at Amnesty. And this report, um, well, I, I'm the primary author of this report, which I'll talk to you about today. Um, I will say the report is quite long. And so I'm going to try and sort of do it justice in <laughs> a fairly short amount of time. But if there's any questions that you have of things that you maybe wanted to covered, um, just please feel free to ask me. Um, so next slide, please. Um, just because I think it's helpful for people to understand how we research these reports, I'm just very quickly going to talk about the methodology because I understand it's also like not the most interesting <laughs> thing about the report. But this report is in some ways very similar to the re report that was written about Myanmar, particularly in terms of the methodology we used around it. So we, much of the evidence of Meta's kind of internal knowledge of the risks of its business model and the risks that were present in Ethiopia came from the Facebook papers, which, as many people here, I'm sure, are aware, was are a, a kind of cache of internal documents which were leaked in 2021. 
Um, and although that feels like that was quite a long time ago, actually, many of the papers cover the period that was relevant to this um, report, which was looking specifically at 2020, November 2020 to November 2022, when the armed conflict was um, kind of really at a peak and before there was a cessation of hostilities agreement signed. Um, we also conduct an analysis of META's human rights responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, and in terms of the Ethiopia context, you know, I'm not a country expert, but this report has been built on previous Amnesty International reports on Ethiopia and with the support of our regional office. Um, and we also then supplemented the evidence from the Facebook papers and other sources with interviews with Tigrayan community members, civil society experts in Ethiopia and internationally and journalists as well. So just to give you an insight into how we put this together. Um, next slide, please. And I think it's useful to kind of also outline the way that we at Amnesty view Meta's business model, because we would argue, we do argue that actually the business model in its entirety is um, incompatible with Meta's responsibility to respect human rights. And the reason that we say that is because their business model is based, we call it the surveillance based business model. It's essentially built on corporate surveillance, which means there's an incentive to harvest and exploit more data about people by keeping them online. Um, and the algorithms are therefore kind of tuned to promote inflammatory and hate-filled content on the platform, because unfortunately, that's often what will make people <laughs> stay and look, even if it's not because they agree with the content, but because they find it so shocking. Um, and the longer someone stays on the platform, the more data can be collected about them, which means they're better able to be targeted with ads, which is really sort of the foundation of the business model. Um, and we would say there's evidence for, in this report and from the previous report that Amnesty did that this model is particularly detrimental in conflict affected settings like Ethiopia, where human rights harms are more pronounced, you know, tension, social political tensions are more pronounced. Um, but in general, the business model impacts on a range of human rights, which include, but are not limited to, the right to freedom of expression, the right to equality, the right to non-discrimination. So this is sort of our foundational analysis of Meta's business model. Next slide, please. Um, and also, I just wanted to touch quickly on the context in Ethiopia, because I'm sure that, you know, not everyone here no, knows that, um, at least during, for the period that the research was looking at. So it, as I mentioned, in November 2020, an armed conflict broke out in northern Ethiopia between forces aligned with the federal government and the Tigray regional government. Um, it's really difficult to kind of underestimate how, um, or sorry, to overestimate how devastating this conflict was, it's estimated that it resulted in up to 600,000 civilian deaths. Um, at the time, Facebook was the most dominant social media platform in Ethiopia and still is today. Um, and during the conflict, the platform became awash with content which advocated hate and incited violence against the Tigrayan community. And what's particularly significant is that um, the these were government figures and pro-government activists, but especially pro-government -gov figures were using the platform themselves to kind of post harmful content, which contributed to dehumanizing narratives against the Tigrayan community. And we know that language plays a, a huge role in dehumanization of a community. And, um, you know, there, there were phrases being used like junta, which was implying that all Tigrayan civilians were um, fighters referring to the Tigrayan community as weeds or a cancer. So kind of really, um, really disturbing language, language which is clearly really problematic. Um, and actually much of that was used by the Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed himself. There was a Facebook post from 2021 where he talks about um, pulling up the weeds referring to the, the Tigrayan community. And that post at the time that the report was published was actually still visible on the platform but so that's just to give you an example of the kind of content which was being really widely spread um and actually not not taken down and much of that still remains on the platform today 
Um, next slide, please. And for, yeah, so further evidence of the role that social media plays was actually included in the Independent um, Commission of Human Rights Experts on Ethiopia, which was the UN um, mechanism, like fact-finding mechanism on the Ethiopian conflict, um, who actually said that the prevalence of hate speech in Ethiopia, in particular online, was really pivotal in stoking tensions and um, created a climate where people became targets of incitement and cause for violence. Um, and in their final report, they said that the full extent um, that social media played in Ethiopia merited further independent investigation. And so this report is hopefully part of an answer to this to that call about the impact that social media had um, in during the conflict in Ethiopia. But this is, yeah, so just to say this is something that has been kind of flagged also by a UN fact-finding mechanism that there were really serious um, things to consider. And I would also mention that um, the Facebook platform specifically is also mentioned in the ICHR double E uh, final report, much like the um, Myanmar fact-finding mechanism also mentioned Facebook in their their final report on the atrocities against the Rohingya. And actually through the presentation, we'll kind of see that unfortunately there are a lot of parallels between the role that was that Facebook played um, in Myanmar in 2017 and has played even more recently in Ethiopia. And this is just the, the first of many parallels that I'll be pointing out in, in the briefing. Um, next slide, please. And a final kind of flag that I want to, to make before we go into the findings, because it was part of what motivated this research. Um, and I think it's it also shows the possible legal Im implications of um, you know, Meta's uh, conduct in, in Ethiopia. In December last year, some civil litigation was um, submitted against Meta in Kenya but which was actually related to Ethiopia and it, it alleged, this litigation alleges that Meta's algorithms inflamed the conflict in Ethiopia um, because of its content shaping algorithms. And the petitioners are seeking to basically have Meta change the algorithm, um, but also to compel the company to create a um, $1.6 billion victims fund. Um, Amnesty International is actually an interested party in this case, so we're not bringing the case, but we're supporting it in the Kenyan court. Um, and actually one of our own staff members is a petitioner who was targeted as a, a result of um, posts on the social media platform for his human rights work in Ethiopia. Um, so I just wanted to kind of flag that because this was an important reason for us to kind of do this research. Um, and also just to say that we're not trying to make an assessment of whether Meta should be found guilty in this case. The report is based on the um, UN guiding principle, so it's not based on Kenyan legal standards. And just to be really clear that we're not trying to say that. Um, so, but it's an, an important reason why um, we wanted to take take a look at this research and see if we could contribute to the the case. Um, next slide, please. So I I thought that maybe we could go back in time a little bit to 2018, um, because 2018 is a really interesting year in terms of what was happening uh, in Meta at the time, because this was the year when um, the meaningful social engagement metric was introduced and um, oh, meaningful social interaction, pardon me. So this was basically meant to be like a break from the way that met the Facebook platform had previously operated. And when it was first touted um, by Mark Zuckerberg, he actually said, this is um, going to fix Facebook, because the idea behind it was that people would spend more time having meaningful social interactions, which I also note was never really defined by the company like what that meant but it the idea was that you would see more content from your friends than from news sources and that was kind of the main thing um what we see from the facebook papers is that actually the meaningful social interaction metric wasn't a uh, 
any kind of significant break from the way that the platform had previously worked. It actually really sort of doubles down on this engagement at all costs um, system. And it's really significant to what happened in Ethiopia because much of the content which was going viral was going viral because it was receiving so many comments and so many reshares and that had been added into the metric of like what the algorithm will push and so actually it wasn't any more the case that people were just seeing things because you know there'd been some engagement but and and it had been boosted that way but people were actually because of the way the platform started working being encouraged to um to post content which was going to have lots of comments which was going to have lots of reshares um and people were being encouraged to comment on things as well and respond to reactions in the comments and things like this um and actually that meant that things would still spread because they were inflammatory and divisive and actually it sort of like invited people to have more interactions on those posts um, and this is something that in the case studies in the Ethiopia report came up you know time and time again with people who had been targeted or had family members targeted saying you know the amount of comments was unbelievable the amount of reshares that um, posts would get was so high that it would travel so far they wouldn't be able to um to, to kind of keep up with the way that the information was spreading on the platform. Um, and so what I think the MSI kind of pivot shows us is that engagement is really hardwired into the business model. This engagement at all costs um, approach is, is really fundamental. And I think that that is really at the root of a lot of the problems that we have seen um, with the platform and in particular in conflict affected settings because engagement will be prioritized over basically everything else um, and we see that again specifically in the um, Facebook papers where there's discussions of potential mitigation measures that could have been taken to kind of slow down um, the virality of posts specifically in Ethiopia um, and comments being made on the document saying oh but we wouldn't we wouldn't do that if it went if it was going to compromise meaning the meaningful social interactions metric so it's it's really clear that um you know again similarly to what had happened in Myanmar it there was a decision made that actually the engagement of the platform should be prioritized even though there were problems in the way that that was playing out in in Ethiopia, which we can also, we also see from the Facebook papers, you know, employees were aware of had been trying to flag to, um, you know, higher up in in Meta, um, and I think it's just really important to kind of emphasise that this was meant to be a break away from sort of all the nasty stuff that that had happened on on Facebook, but actually MSI is just a continuation of the same thing um, and I think it's really important that that's understood and sort of chat that it's challenged um you know it that it's not really made a big difference and actually it's kind of just made people interact with with virality in a in a different way but it still encourages that kind of thing and the algorithms are still boosting things which are inflammatory and divisive which you know is clearly very problematic has problematic in Ethiopia it was problematic in Myanmar um even in non-conflict affected settings it's a real issue that remains on the platform despite this new metric um next slide please um and so I wanted to talk also a little bit about the mitigation measures that were taken by Meta because you know they did take some mitigation measures, um, and it, I think it's kind of important to to acknowledge that. Um, and these included improved content moderation, both in terms of its um, speech classifiers and hiring more people um, who actually spoke the main languages of Ethiopia, and putting some limits on on reshares um, so that they couldn't travel quite as far. Um, However, what I would say about that is these measures were implemented in June 2021. The 
conflict in Ethiopia started in November 2022. And given the how high the level of risk was for for you know um advocacy of hatred and post inciting violence to spread on Facebook in Ethiopia, I think these measures are really just too little, too late. And I, I think it's really actually it's concerning because if this is how a, a priority country, which Ethiopia is is for Meta, is treated in a time of crisis, it really makes me feel concerned about what is happening in countries which are not necessarily priorities because there's much more that they could have done as much more they should have done. We've seen that in the Facebook papers that there were other options being considered which weren't taken because they would, um, you know, they would in in metadata like unnecessarily um, adversely impact the um, the engagement metrics. Um, I also just wanted to kind of talk about the fact that Meta had received warnings from civil society actors and human rights experts, both inside and outside of Ethiopia, about the danger of contributing to violence and actually had had received those warnings both before and during the conflict. And I think that that also means that the mitigation measures that they took, considering the amount of warnings they were receiving, um, is a really sort of not enough. They're, they're le- I would say they're kind of less than minimal, to, to be honest. Um, but it it also again there's an echo here of what happened in Myanmar, which was that they also received many many warnings from people about what would happen, and those warnings weren't heeded. Um, and I actually spoke to someone for this research who's part of the Trusted Partners Program in Ethiopia, which has sort of like a special um, channel to Meta in order to flag uh, content which needs to be taken down. And the quote on the slide is actually from them where they said, I told Facebook many times that they were going to contribute to violence. Those people who are talking to you as in the people from Meta, they say they understand, but it's a big and bureaucratic organization. I don't think they care much about what is happening on the ground. Um, And I think that's quite an indictment from someone who's a trusted partner to say that they don't think that they're taken seriously. They they think that Meta doesn't really, um, you know, basically like doesn't care what's happening in Ethiopian that was also something that came through several times. Also, when I spoke to a content moderator who worked on Ethiopian content, really similar um, feeling that when they flagged things that they should, that they felt should have changed, um, they were basically just ignored. Um, I know that we're short for time, but one thing that I also really wanted to flag was that in 2019, the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, David Kay, um, went to Ethiopia on a trip and as a result of that trip wrote an um a letter to Meta saying that they needed to be careful about their operations um it was included in a report sorry it wasn't a letter but said that um Meta really needed to engage with civil society organizations better in Ethiopia because of concerns around the kind of content that was circulating on the platform that was allowed to stay up on the platform um and that was traveling on the platform um and yeah i mean count like in 2019 also there was a, a series of civil society meetings in ethiopia where people flagged specifically actually concerns about the algorithm um and were kind of brushed off by the the meta representatives that they had um that they had the meeting with i spoke to someone who was at a separate meeting in 2019 who said that they had told meta they were really worried about what was happening on the Facebook platform and they felt that they weren't being listened to in the meetings and they so distressed that they started crying in in the meeting because they felt like they were just not being heard at all so that's just to give you a a sense of you know the kinds of warnings that they were getting even before the the conflict broke out they were quite serious and they were coming from you know many different corners from the special rapporteur from civil society in Ethiopia um and they didn't take, you know, adequate measures before to ensure that violence wouldn't break out. Um, next slide, or that they wouldn't contribute to violence. Next slide, please. Um, and I just want also to flag that um, during the conflict, the Facebook Oversight Board made a recommendation um, 
around the need for an independent human rights due diligence assessment on how Facebook had been used to spread hate speech and verified rumors that heighten the risk of violence in Ethiopia. Um, this was in 2022. Um, and Meta have not produced a human rights due diligence assessment, which their oversight board recommended that they do. Um, and I think that it shows a kind of lack of willing, well, well, it appears to be, in my view, like a lack of willingness to really engage on this issue. Um, the last thing that they said was in, was a few months after this came out where they had basically said, we will assess the feasibility of this human rights due diligence assessment, but nothing has come, um, you know, from that, it's not clear if anything ever will. We asked Meta about it um, in a letter. They didn't provide an answer um, to that specific question. But I think it's really, again, really concerning that, you know, this is the second time now that Meta has been found by Amnesty International, at least, to have contributed to really serious human rights abuses. Um, and the response to their own oversight board was that basically they weren't going to look into the issue in more depth when it was flagged to them. Um, so I think, again, it's it shows that many people were trying to tell them that they needed to do more and um, needed to understand more about the impact that Facebook was having in Ethiopia. Next slide, please. Um, and I just wanted to use this case study to outline um, the kinds of harms that were happening in Ethiopia. Maybe people have heard of this case before because it's been um, covered in, in the media. Um, Professor Amara Mehrag was a um, Tigrayan professor in a university. Um, his son, Abraham, is a litigant in the Kenya case. Um, Professor Amara was targeted by a Facebook page called BDU Staff in uh, 20. 21, who, who, uh, this Facebook staff page had more than 50,000 followers. Um, it published his name, um, address, photo, place of work, and alleged that he was a former TPLF fighter, among kind of other things. Um, and people were calling for death in, in the comments. Um, there were two posts that came from this page. His son, reported the original post and reshares, but didn't receive a response from um, Meta or was told that it didn't violate the community standards because he tried several times to report the posts. Um, and he said in his own words, the Facebook post was everywhere. It traveled really far. It felt like everyone was seeing it. Um, and the Facebook posts stayed up. And three weeks after the posts um, first emerged, Professor Mara Mireg was followed home from his place of work and he was shot dead outside of his home. Um, and when I spoke to Abraham, he told me that the people who had attacked his father had been kind of echoing the things that had been said on the Facebook posts. Um, and the Facebook posts were only taken down eight days after the, the professor was killed. Um, and I, in fact, one of them was only taken down after the um, case in Kenya was filed, which was in December 2022. So that content was allowed to stay up on the platform for a very long time. Um, and, you know, certainly I think they, this post, these posts were like a major contributor to this, to this violence. And, um, you know, there's that, there's reason to think that there will have been people who faced similar um, experiences and were, you know, put at risk for a really long time because of content being allowed to stay up and, and being um, amplified by the algorithms on the platform in, in Ethiopia. Um, next slide, please. So just to very quickly say the key findings of the report are that a lack of adequate investment in Ethiopia combined with a business model that prioritized engagement above everything else um, is what has resulted in the Facebook platform contributing to these human rights abuses. Um, and again, Meta made many of the same systemic failures in Ethiopia as it did in Myanmar, which happened just three years prior to the conflict breaking out in, in um, Ethiopia. And this included, as I said, 
um, previously ignoring warnings from civil society and um, inadequate staffing of operations in the country and the lack of investment in human rights due diligence methods. Next slide, please. Um, just very quickly, because I feel like I'm probably over time. Um, in terms of what is next, what we would like to see next, firstly, Meta um, ha you know, has a, a responsibility to provide a remedy for the harm it has contributed to, and that crucially should include a guarantee of non-repetition um, anywhere in the world, actually, but specifically in Ethiopia, because Ethiopia remains a conflict-affected setting. There's a crisis in the Amhara region um, right now, which means that, you know, Facebook, there's a real risk that Facebook will again contribute to human rights abuses um, of, of such severity. Um, and I, I think that the fact that this has happened, you know, in Myanmar and in Ethiopia, really shows that what happened in Myanmar is not an aberration, which I think it's often kind of presented as as being this, you know, really awful event in the history of, of Meta, which will never be repeated and lessons have been learned. I think that what this report finds is that that's just not the case at all. Um, and the fact that Meta kind of do, so far hasn't really, really kind of... Um, even being open to kind of discussing what happened in Ethiopia leads me to feel that it's it's very likely this will happen again in a conflict affected setting um, and that reform of the business model is absolutely necessary. There's no um, there's no way that an engagement at all costs um, business model is is compatible with meeting human rights responsibilities. And I think, you know, it, there shouldn't have to be another sort of like amnesty report about Meta's contribution for that to to be taken really seriously um and yeah I mean Frances Haugen the Facebook papers whistleblower said it herself when she said what we saw in Myanmar and what we are seeing now in Ethiopia are only the beginning chapters of a story so terrifying no one wants to read to the end of it um and so I think you know there's an opportunity to kind of prevent further harms in Ethiopia with with more mitigation measures, more robust due diligence, Meta really, really needs to to do that. Um, you know, Im like immediately as soon as possible. But in the longer term, the the sort of engagement at all costs way that the platform operates has has to change in order for Meta to really be able to meet its human rights responsibilities. Um, and I I'll end it there. And I apologize if I um spoke for too long. <laughs> Thank Quite you. Right, Alia. We started a bit late. So really, and thank you. That was really a, a helpful overview of your research and this report. I encourage everyone to read it if they haven't had a chance to do so. And I think absolutely disturbing to see that unfortunately this seems to be a systemic problem that's repeating itself. And maybe Laura can fill us in um, in a second here after we hear from Jamie with regards to what hopes we might have that uh, indicating this new human rights report that Meta is changing course and, and changing the narrative that's in that storyline that Francis Haugen mentioned. Um, just one quick point of clarification, and, and maybe this is something Jamie will speak to. I wasn't quite clear. Why is Kenya um, the jurisdiction for this civil suit? Can you just maybe just clarify that? Yeah, of course. So Kenya is the jurisdiction for the civil suit because the content which which um is seen in Ethiopia is moderated via Kenya. Um and Facebook doesn't have, as far as I know, any sort of like physical presence or office in Ethiopia, but Kenya is the place where at, at least at that time their their Africa operations were um being sort of coordinated from. So that's been the reason why Kenya is the jurisdiction. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Well, and then on that note, let me turn it over to Jamie. Jamie, I think you're going to update us a little bit about the current situation in Ethiopia and potentially also the lawsuit, if I'm not mistaken. I'll just hand it over to you. Thanks for being here today. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thanks, Rebecca. So, um, you know, as Alia has said, the situation in Tigray was very alarming and led to a lot of destruction, death, um, and it lasted for over about two years. The conflict started in November of 2020, and the cessation of hostilities um, was only formalized 
last year on November the 2nd. Um, and a lot of our work on the conflict in Tigray was around the internet shutdown, which at the time was the longest shutdown that we had documented in the region. Um, but there was a connection between the internet shutdown being instituted or Ethiopia having a history of instituting internet shutdowns and um, this occurring as a result of them using the justification of, of um, disinformation and hate speech spreading on platforms like Facebook um, as a justification to shut down the internet so that it would halt maybe the spread of that disinformation and hate speech. Um, but what we observed is that it didn't, you know, it didn't deter or de-escalate the situation in any way. If anything, it just made the situation worse. It made it difficult for people to be able to access information during the conflict, to be able to stay in contact with their loved ones or to maybe access really life-saving information that could potentially prevent them from um, facing risks, threat, or the potential maybe of even death. Um, so that's mostly the work that we did, that Access Now did around um, the conflict in Tigray um, for the past two years. We um, filed, we submitted a joint petition to the African Union at the Africa IGF last year. And I think one of the most concerning things um, to come out of that that hap or that happened during um, that event was the president actually, you know, reiterating the justification of social media platforms being used to spread disinformation during the conflict in Tigray as a justification to shut down the internet. So it seems that even though there has been a lot of accountability that has been demanded from authorities because of the atrocities that happened during the conflict and how the internet shutdown has you know, aided, whether that's government authorities or the militia um, forces to you know, evade accountability and hide um, the human rights violations that they committed during the conflict, it doesn't seem that um, these calls to accountability or the reporting on the um, the scale of human rights violations and just how much they impede um, so many you know human rights during conflict that that is changing the position of the government authorities in any way, which um, is concerning. And now that brings me to um, the conflict in Amhara, but even before we get to Amhara. Um, so the cessation of hostilities, the agreement was signed in November of last year. Ideally, this should mean that there should be a ceasefire and there should be a restoration of um, like maybe services, telecommunication um, access, um, and just restore, re, re, restoration of um activities um, in Tigray and no violence um, during, in the region. But it has still been reported that even a year after um, the agreement was signed, there is still violence that is happening um, in the region. There's still difficulty for even the African Union monitoring um, teams to be able to access the region to be able to do the documentation that they need to do as part of like the transitional process and even in um, the areas that border with Eritrea there's still some violence happening there from the Eritrean forces which should not have happened which should not be happening with um, the agreement to cease hostilities since last year but that's something that's still happening even now um, so the situation or the feeling on the ground I think for a lot of people is that even though formally there should no longer be violence it's still something that they're having to face and even with the restoration of telecommunication services, neither the TPLF or the, the federal government want to take responsibility. But our position has always been that regardless of who was responsible of disrupting um, of the network disruptions, it's the responsibility of the government to restore those communications. Um, so seeing that 
you know, the sentiment of the government is still that they believe that internet shutdowns are necessary during times of conflict to prevent or mitigate the spread of hate speech and disinformation. That is something um, that is really concerning for us, but I think also drives home, you know, the fact, the issues that Alia has mentioned earlier that um, when platforms like Facebook don't give enough resources in our region to moderate content or are not transparent about, you know, how the la natural language processing algorithm algorithms that they use to detect um, hateful or extremist content, um, do they actually have the ability to detect content or potentially violating content in non-speaking, non-English speaking, I mean, non-English languages that are spoken in countries like Ethiopia? When we don't have that transparency and we also have inconsistencies in, re in responses, then I think that also lends to the kind of government overreach that we're seeing in Ethiopia, where the president can say they can shut down the internet because they'll need to do that to prevent um, hate speech and disinformation from spreading during conflict. Um, so there's also been active conflict in the Amhara region in Ethiopia. Earlier this year, um, the federal government announced a plan to um, disband the regional um, security forces and integrate them into the national army. Um, but this was not a decision that was received well. And because of that conflict broke out between the federal military and the regional forces in Amhara in April. And that was the first time that the internet shutdown was in instituted in Amhara in the region. And it was reinstituted, but again, shut down on the 3rd of August, which was a day before the president declared a state of emergency in the region, um, which now uh, was necessary because of the escalation of the conflict um, between the regional forces and the national army. Um, and the reports that we've been receiving from partners, but also from the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission has been really, really concerning. Um, I think in August, the UN reported that about 183 people had been killed. Um, and in the recent um, Ethiopian Human Rights Commission report, there's reports of, you know, extrajudicial killings happening through um, drone strikes, um, but also the national security forces carrying out door-to-door um, -door searches and, and killing people unlawfully. Um, so when we hear these reports, while this violence is also happening under the cover of an internet shutdown, um, that's something of really real concern to us. Um, and we've also seen private telecommunication companies like Safaricom, um, you know, seize um, their operations in the region because of the conflict. Um, so that's also something that has been really concerning. But even when we're thinking about um, what kind of human rights due diligence companies, telecommunications companies do um, before they enter markets and the kind of risks um, that that could bring in, in, a, in a conflict area um, like Amhara. So that has also been concerning for us from the business and human rights end. Um, and Jamie, I know I'm just very sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'm very aware of the time. Um, <laughs> we want to leave some time for Laura to offer a few remarks and yeah. some questions and answers. And I'm hoping, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'm hoping maybe, I know this is um, some, Access Now has done some great work to highlight some of these ongoing concerns, uh, particularly with internet shutdowns in the area. And maybe um, if if we, uh, we could move on to Laura, you could offer some of those resources in the chat function as well, um, if that's okay with you. Thank you. That's fine. Thanks. Okay, great. So just aware of the time, apologies, Laura, if I could turn it to you to maybe give us a quick analysis in a few minutes of where things stand now with Meta. Are we seeing a break in this narrative? Um, you know, they put out their new human rights report, or should we expect more of the same? What's your analysis in particular, given the changing regulatory landscape? Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Um, apologies for the audio only today, but um, without further ado, I will just get, jump right in. I have also 
uh, prepared a document with all these remarks that I'm going to make, and I will send it to to Rebecca and, and Aditi and Anita to be shared. Nice. So there's no need to, to worry about taking any notes or anything. But in terms of um, what's going on, obviously, as, as Aliyah and Jamie said, the situation is alarming. And, and what re remains a concern is obviously the fact that, as again has been repeated already, we are not seeing any change. And when it comes to Meta's, how Meta talks about their human rights work, there seems to be a, a persistent conflict in terms of how they themselves present their progress versus how the rest of the world perceives Meta's progress or lack of pro pro progress in human rights. And um, I just wanna offer a few very concrete remarks on the recent um, human rights report for, for your for thoughts on what are the actual recommendations that we should all be asking Meta to put in place at the moment, given particularly um, considering that the year 2024 is a super election year with an estimated 2.6 billion people um, taking the vote across the globe. Um, Meta keeps saying in their second human rights report, for example, for India, that they're quote unquote putting in place um, preparations to make sure they're prepared for the, for the general elections in India, but they're not saying what they're doing. And that's, that's always, that seems to be a persistent problem with Meta. They talk a lot, but there's no real content in what they say. They need to be able to commit to deadlines and complete metrics on how and what they intend to implement um, in terms of demonstrating progress in their human rights work. And Aliyah mentioned the Tr Trusted Partners Program. So that's a very good example. They report on a KPI on the, the number of trusted partners in their program. That really doesn't add any value when it's a well-known fact that the Trusted Partner Program is not working because Meta is not doing their end of the, the deal. They're not corresponding with the trusted partners. So instead, Meta should, for example, report on their own response times to incident raised by trusted partners on or, or on the overall time in which the incidents uh, raised by trusted partners are resolved. Um, I think that part of the, the, the frustration also within the civil society is the fact that Meta seems to be very self-congratulatory in documenting about uh, disclosing about their human rights work. Um, I, <laughs> I, I believe, this is my own personal reflection, that if they, op if they were to openly acknowledge and address the challenges in the business and human rights work in their reporting, uh, their reporting would be more powerful. If they were to address the fact that um, they're dealing with issues that they can not necessarily solve themselves, but they seem to present everything as problem solved. When even when the, the the external evidence uh, points to the contrary. So that only diminishes the company's credibility, not to mention uh, the fact, the more sinister fact that it, it provides a platform literally to for continued human rights violations. Nothing's being done and we can also see what's going on, what has recently been going on uh, according to media and civil society, civil society reports about content moderation in Palestine and for Palestinian content. Uh, the censorship and the uh, account closures and the problems with order translators and everything else. It's very clear that no improvements are being put in place, even after Ethiopia. Um, so having said that, I, I think that part of the, in, in terms of um, what, what the frustration is and what, what what should be done is that I think that most often um, the discussion with the meta teams, it's with the investor relations teams, it's with the human rights team. So part of the challenge is, and part of the question that I would actually ask is whether any of this feedback from external stakeholders is actually reaching the board, the meta board, and then trying to figure out how to get to, how the guests get the message to the board for them to finally, hopefully start taking at least some of it seriously. Um, one very practical solution to um, 
getting more transparency out of Meta um, in, in a short term would also be to just maybe perhaps revisit or visit and familiar, familiarize uh, with the recently published EU digital services disclosures that Meta has published for Instagram and Facebook. Because even though these reports currently only cover the EU countries, um, there is some very interesting information that could be helpful for other regions as well. Like for example, uh, insights on the company's content moderation processes, um, including numbers on um, content moderations in local languages versus the overall platform users in a specific country and so on. So it's very clear if you look at these reports for Instagram and Facebook, that Meta now has a reporting and data collection infrastructure in place to provide this kind of information, this kind of detailed information on their content moderation po policies and processes. So my advice would be to also for the stakeholders to consider starting to request Meta to release similar information to the EU Digital Services Act for their other key regions like Ethiopia. And I, I think I'll maybe just stop there for now um, and in yes. case anyone has any questions. Well, that, Thank that's you. great. Thank you, Lourdes. And those are very, I think for our investors in the call, very concrete suggestions in terms of making sure um, that the board is also getting the necessary information out of the, the dialogues that are happening as part of the Trusted Partners Program and asking for the disclosure of the data on a global level what they have to disclose in the EU. But we've already got a question, so I'm going to pass it right over to Christina since we only have a few minutes left. Certainly not so much a question as, as we've been talking with folks from Access Now, and we had previously filed a shareholder resolution last year on similar conditions in India um, and the political entanglements, but also um, the lack of moderation, et cetera. And just to say that we are planning to refile this year, um, but to expand that resolution to incorporate um, the uh, sort of parallel conditions that we've seen in Brazil, uh, we're seeing in Palestine, in Ethiopia, building on Amnesty's amazing work there, um, also uh, addressing Cambodia. Um, so we're very open to um, allies, partners, co-filers, et cetera, as that comes down. And I'll, I'll put my contact information in the uh, chat because we're hoping oh, to Christina. work That'd together. Be great. And, and sorry, I just missed the, what, so what, what's the result clause then for this resolution? The resolve is uh, the India one was to release the um, uh, human rights impact assessment on India, which has not been released. Um, this will be expanded, so it will incorporate um, the uh, the items that, for example, that Access Now is mentioning of uh, just the documentation of the number of uh, of the moderation staff, um, the response time for trusted partners. Um, we've seen these things consistently. We did a lot of work on Brazil on this and and uh, during the Brazil January 6 experience as it's called. Um, so reflecting that. So we hope to work with others, um, other friends in ICCR on that. Great. Yeah, and please do put your, your contact information in the chat yeah. function. Other questions, you can gladly raise your hand, come off mute or uh, put a question in the chat function. Well, if no one's going to ask a question, or Anita, you have a question? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, um, I, I actually, uh, why don't you go ahead? Why don't you go ahead? Rebecca? Well, I was just going to, I was going to follow up with Laura on something in particular. I remember, and I have to, I only glanced at uh, Meta's human rights report, but there was a kind of crisis policy that they've supposedly developed. Um, with you link through to the policy, you'll see it's a short three paragraphs on their website. But nevertheless, I just wanted to hear for, if you have any thoughts with regards to the, this crisis policy and if that may potentially be the beginning of an effort to try to think more systematically um, on the part of Meta about how their business activities are touching and if, uh, upon conflicts and affecting conflict dynamics, uh, oftentimes to the worst. That's a very good question. Thank you, Rebecca. I will... Um quickly respond to it. And I would also invite our business and human rights lead, Isera Rubibor, who is in the call to weigh in, if we have time for that. Um, I don't remember the, the wording uh, in the report on the crisis policy, but overall, there's one thing I would say that um, when you read through the meta reports, any reports on their human rights work, 
uh, it's exhausting reading because on the surface, it looks like they're doing so much. They're just doing amazing work. But the thing is that they're, what, there's one thing that they're very good at and that's creating distraction. So um, they're not, I, my, I would seriously question whether just reporting on different items is very, it really adds value rather than reporting on the impact of their work. And that's that's really what's lacking in most of Meta's disclosures on human rights. But again, I just want to invite you Sarah to weigh in very quickly if possible. Yeah, Sarah, did you want to add anything to what Laura just said? Sure, just I know we have like two minutes left, but I'll say, yeah, I fully echo what um, Laura said. Honestly, I'm not really familiar with that crisis policy, which should say a lot about the weight that it's given in this report. Um, considering that crisis has been one of the big issues uh, that civil society has been pushing Meta on for a while. Um, they still are not giving it the level of attention um, that it deserves. And, you know, like a short three paragraph, however long it is, um, outline of what they will do, it still leaves a lot to be desired. Um, so honestly, for Meta, what we're looking for is implementation, um, because they do have in this human rights report as well, a lot of focus on human rights offenders. But as you heard from Laura, the Trusted Partners Program, which is something that is meant to directly benefit human rights offenders, is still very lacking. So uh, for Meta, it's a lot of a gap between the stated policies and then the actual implementation in reality. Sorry, was, Anita, did you want to jump yeah, in? The question I was just going to ask, I was going to ask Alia that it's a result, and I, I don't know what the sensitivities are here also because you're also in the in the suit, uh, you know, the lawsuit. But as a result of the report, I mean, is there any interaction with Meta during, before, after the report uh, that is instructive, you know, just to, to find out whether there's, there's, there's really any response from them? Um, so we, we, yeah, so we wrote to Meta... Um, with some research questions, which they answered some of, but not really stuff that was relevant to the litigation, um, which was in fact, most of the questions. <laughs> um, we sent also, we sent them a letter to let them know about the report and the findings of the report. And they replied and said, they don't agree. And that was basically it. <laughs> um, and, and they said, you know, we have to, because of the litigation, they can't sort of respond more fully, which is fine. But I, yeah. But so basically that's that's it. Like they, we haven't had any other um, contact with them really beyond, beyond that. Okay, now thanks so much for that, Thank you. And I know that it's the end of time, so Rebecca. Yeah, and I just wanted to, I saw Neve's um, chat comment, but I just wanted to say, Neve, please do reach out also out to Anita um, and add it to you directly. Um, they're copied on some of the communications for this uh, to get it, but we have a, an entire digital rights and AI uh, engagement that involves other companies as well. So please do reach out. Well, first of all, a big thank you um, to Alia, to Jamie, to Laura. Um, this was really tremendous informative um you know kudos to amnesty for its ongoing research you know really helping to counter the narrative these are singular incidents and in showing that we've got a systemic problem that really needs to be addressed here so um yeah just thank you everybody and we will have this recording available should you have any colleagues friends family you want to share this with uh, we posted uh, in not too long um, on our website and we will send an email to follow up with you with that information thanks everyone take care thanks and so have much, a good Holly. rest of your days yeah bye-bye Thank you. It's really good. Thank you.